in some ways, it does limit us. I mean, we can't put our experiences into language that would perfectly describe them in all of their sensory array to sure. another person, right? But we can get them closer to the edge of what that is so that then they can step in and experience it themselves. And so I found after looking at a number of different Western systems, Hermeticism was the one that I came up with because they have no dogma. You know, they exist as a set of rules that basically what works, works, regardless of the tradition. If it works for you and you can make it work, that's great. Everything else you can kind of throw out and, uh, you know, you don't have to have a certain belief system or anything else. You can actually make these processes work. Um, it's just a conditioning of your mind. And through your experience with a feedback loop, you put that back into your understanding and go deeper. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the process is endless. Welcome to Letting Go and the Greatest Secret, where we explore the end of your suffering and the beginning of lasting happiness. I'm Hale Dwoskin, and today I'll be interviewing Brian Osborne. Brian Osborne has more than 40 years experience in spiritual training, study, and practice, including Taoism, Western esoteric practices, and work with a North American roadman and South American shamans. His published courses include Aura Seeing and Four Elements Manifestation. So before we get into um, our conversation, can you just tell uh, our listeners a little bit about yourself and how you got into this direction and, you know, the a little bit of your origin story. The, the nitty gritty of the origins, right? Yes. <laughs> um, well, uh, I've always had a fascination with this material, if we want to call it that, as a broad umbrella heading uh, from a young child. I grew up in a very rural area and spent a lot of time alone. Uh, I had siblings, but you know we didn't live in a neighborhood or that type of thing. So we spent a lot of times in the forest and a nice. uh, very natural setting in upstate New York and in the mountains. Where in upstate? Uh, uh, right around the Lake Placid area. Oh, in sure. That range. Yeah. Yes. So, so very mountainous, if you know it. And, uh, and sparse population wise. So, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time outdoors, a lot of time outdoors, probably more time outdoors than indoors. So uh, we were sort of uh, just in nature constantly. And so that allowed us a lot of time to not only have time to play with each other, but time to be on our own. And so I've always had that. Um, it's never been a problem for me to be you know, in solitude or in those types of scenarios. So I think that lent itself a little bit in this direction because, you know, I had experiences as a kid, you know, very early on all the way up and just never had a vernacular to put around it, no words to really describe it other than my own experiences. So, um, but I was always fascinated by it. And when I uh, decided to leave the area and go away to college, um, the first thing that I thought I would do would be to get a teacher, you know, that was steeped in some tradition. Uh, I didn't know what that was exactly. Uh, I was leaning more toward, let's say, you know, um, Asian philosophy in mm -hmm. that territory, martial arts, those types of things, as a lot of young men do. Mm -hmm. And um, at that time, way back when, you know, there were martial arts studios on every street corner. Oh, and I know. <laughs> I, I went to college in Boston, you know, in the late seventies and, uh, and it was just the heyday for that type of stuff. Right. So yes. I went around looking at just about everything I could get my hands on and didn't really strike me as what I wanted. So I sort of gave up for a little while, just sort of surrendered to it and said, well, you know, uh, I guess when it, when it's ready, it'll appear. And, uh, lo and behold, very shortly after that, maybe a few weeks went by and I had stopped my search and uh, a friend and I were walking, a roommate uh, in college, and he said, hey, look at that 
sign hanging out of that window. And it just was a very simple sign and said Kung Fu on it. And that was it. And so, and I thought, I know every place here. I have looked at every single school in this area. There is no school there. It's gotta be some college kid hanging a flag out his window or something. So, uh, so my friend urged me to go up and take a look and lo and behold, there was uh, a center there. And um, so I knocked on the door and my friend being a good streetwise friend and me being, you know, literally the country mouse never had gone out of the county. <laughs> so being in the big city, um, you know, when the person came to the door was this very large uh, Asian man, then he, uh, you know, my friend just sort of turned around and walked away, walked down the stairs and left me sort of standing there in this presence. And, and he finally just said, do you want to watch a class? And uh, up to that point, it, you know, going to a lot of these schools, it was more like open arms, welcome, come in, you know, do all these things. This guy was very gruff, very <laughs> rough, and just said, and I said, yes. Um, and he said, sit in this chair, don't cross this line, and don't say anything. Uh, so, okay. So, you know, I went ahead and did that. And as soon as I saw him teach, and I saw what they were learning, I was like, this is it, this is the place. And so, uh, that's where my journey started. And so from that point on, I never missed a class. And, um, you know, just one thing went to another from martial arts to Asian theory and philosophy and medicine. And I mean, just everything a monastic uh, lifestyle that he had had was, you know, arranged for me. Uh, and I just couldn't get enough of it. And that was the first place it started. And then, then things just jumped as they usually do after a certain amount of time and knowing what you do know, and especially what you don't know. Um, you know, I moved on to, to other teachers and other traditions and started thinking instead of in a, in an eclectic way, what are the things that are similar around, you know, all of these philosophies and, and there were core principles that were the same. And so that really intrigued me. Um, and so it started me on this process and, and really trying to define as much as I could through my experiences, you know, what it is that I was seeking, what I was trying to do. And, um, and then much later on, how could I relate that to people that were interested? And, um, and that's, that's pretty much it. The rest is history, as they say. And <laughs> I moved from, you know, from that to a, a native, North Native American shaman um, who um, was a roadman, um, worked with, you know, medicines, you know, earth medicines, and, and then moved into um, South American shamanism. Uh, and I worked with, um, you know, probably somebody that you actually know, Alberto Violdo and the Four Winds Society. Mm -hmm. I worked with him for many years and uh, we did tours down to the Amazon and uh, helped with people down there in their becoming. And one thing led to another and I thought, you know, all of these things that I've engaged in so far have all been limited to me in some respects due to language and cultures and the language as we know. So. Um, some of the nuances were difficult to pick up. So I decided to see if there was anything that was similar or something that could bind all of those ideas together in a Western way so that there would be no end to the study or no end to, uh, you know, looking these concepts up and experiencing them and being able to reproduce them and then being able to actually um, explain them to people in common language so that they wouldn't get trapped. And, you know, some of the, some of the language that we hold even to this day, it becomes very obscure if it's not our native language. So um, I think language is a prime, you know, thing that, you know, in some ways it does limit us I and mean, we can't put our experiences into language that would perfectly describe them in all of their sensory array to sure. another person. Right. But right. we can, we can get them closer to the edge of what that is so that then they can step in and experience it themselves. 
and so that's what I tried. So I found after looking at a number of different Western systems, um, Hermeticism was the one that I came up with because they have no dogma. You know, they, they exist as a set of rules that basically, you know, what works, works, you know, depending, you know, regardless of the tradition, if it works for you and you can make it work, that's great. Everything else you can kind of throw out and, uh, um, you know, you don't have to have a certain belief system or anything else. You can actually make these processes work. Um, it's just a conditioning of your mind mm -hmm. and, um, and through your experience with a feedback loop, you put that back into your understanding and go deeper mm -hmm. and, uh, and the process is endless. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, well, it sounds like a, a, a wonderful exploration and a origin. <laughs> so, yeah, no, the, there's a similarity in that the, the Sedona method has no, no dogma. Uh, and it's about discovering what you truly are and letting go of what you're not. Right. Uh, and, uh, and we actually caution people against believing anything we say. Always. It, Every one of my teachers has always said that. Yeah. It's it probably one of those things that uh, if you're truly looking for somebody to help you, it's uh, I found that regardless of the tradition, I was very fortunate enough to get teachers that that was practically their motto. You know, right. don't believe me, um, experience it for yourself. And then, yes. then we can talk. You know? Right, right. <laughs> Well, then we have at least some commonality. Absolutely. Although, especially the deeper the experience or the, the, even when you go beyond experience, language really breaks down. Of course, <laughs> of course. It's a, it's a necessary box so that we can get started, right? Right, so, right, right. Well, yeah. we're having a conversation right now. We're using exactly. language. Exactly. We're not. We're 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 not just making doing sign language. Or <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's yeah. true. I mean, we have to start somewhere, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, even in Buddhist teachings, right? It's the same kind of idea, right? That it's, uh, you know, we can only understand so much. Um, and you know, one of my teacher's teachers said, not everything can be explained, but everything can be experienced. Yes. And so, you know, I've kept that to heart through my, through my life, basically. So that's great. That's great. So you, I think you're somewhat familiar with the greatest secret, the book. Yes. Uh, so how does, how does your, what you teach uh, relate to that? I think in some ways, I mean, I think at the core of the idea, it relates exactly uh, the methodology of getting there. I probably break into more steps if we want to call it that. Mm -hmm. So for most people I've found, again, this is just my experience. I found that for most people, um, there's that uplifting part of the secret and the greatest secret and books like that, or, you know, any material like that, that's so intriguing to people because on a deeper level, they, they feel it intuitively. It's not, it's beyond just wanting it to be true. They feel the truth of it. And, um, yeah, there's some resonance. It, yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, but for me, I found that uh, for myself as well, and probably just, you know, maybe I was just a slow learner. It took me 40 years to kind of get there, <laughs> you know, but, but at the same time, um, you know, I found that there are a lot more people like me <laughs> in that respect and that, um, you know, sometimes the, the simplicity of it is almost too abstract for people, you know, that a lot of people need because especially Western people, because we grow up in a place where, you know, the methodology of how we learn things is ingrained in us. And it's for the most part, a step-by-step -step procedure. I mean, nobody expects a kindergartner to, you know, understand spatial geometry. Right. But at the same time, you know, we 
put them through the steps so they can get to a point if that's their proclivity to go there and experience it. And I think the same thing with this. So what I've found from the traditions that I've studied and, and the way that I teach is that people enjoy the working at it. You know, they enjoy, I mean, yeah, it would be nice to snap your fingers and be awareness instantly. And then, you know, your human experience will be done right? because <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't have any challenges to pit yourself against. You wouldn't have well, any. Well, maybe, be. but that's, that's possibly true, but isn't it also possible that, uh, that recognizing that you are awareness is a great place to start. It's not necessarily a finishing place. Oh yeah. I mean, let's say it's the, you know, it's the context you know, right. of where we're starting, right? Yes, but then yes. how do we achieve it? You know, how do we not achieve it even? How do we experience it? Mm -hmm. You know, and for me, you know, there are plenty of step-by-step uh, -step techniques, procedures, you know, places where we can go and measure so that, you know, we know that we're not, I mean, the one thing that I think everyone could agree with is that time is the, you know, the thing that we have in, you know, somewhat limited supply and, and that we, the worst thing that you could probably do, and this is a very Taoist idea, but is waste your time. <laughs> right. So it's like, uh, because it's not something you can get back. And so you want to know, I think a lot of people in the West want to know that what they're trying to not achieve, but what they're trying to do is actually producing some effect that's positive in their life, you know, Oh, sure, um, sure. Yeah, we're, we're so, very, we're very goal and purpose uh, and process oriented as a culture. Yeah, absolutely. And even as humanity, I think that, yeah, we're, you know, yeah, we're very yes. goal oriented, right? So, yes. um, so I think that, you know, in my methods are, you know, broken into segments so that, you know, people can experience them. And the accumulation of that experience uh feeds back into you know their study of it and and just that process alone drives them deeper so instead of a full circle i would say you know it's more of a spiral so that you know as you get more experience you know you apply that in the way that you know you can understand it on a deeper level and then through that ex next experience you achieve even more and um yeah. And then how to apply that in your life, I think is a very, uh, that's another part that's extremely valuable. Um, because I think a lot of times uh, with spirituality, if we want to call it that in general, is that, you know, people tend to make it a part of their life and not their life. It doesn't always invade every part it doesn't sort of assimilate in every territory so, sure yeah so i think there are plenty of methods that can be utilized to you know kind of go through that have these experiences but then the real gauge is how does it you know make your life better it, basically i mean that's what we want right we want it mm -hmm. to be what we want it to be and everybody's idea of that is different right? We're all fingerprints. We all have our own idea of what a perfect life would be or whatever that is. And um, so how to apply these things and see that it is making your life better in every aspect. And, you know, we break it down into four, you know, spirituality and success or finance, if you want to count all of that together, you know, relationships and health. Mm -hmm. So in those four general categories, you know, how is your practice affecting those areas and we all expect i mean anybody that's done this even a little bit expects some turmoil in the beginning anytime we go into something new it stirs the pot so to speak so that yes all the yes. debris starts to come up yeah right? actually yes absolutely we can sometimes feel like we're going backwards instead of forwards absolutely and we forget absolutely. that that's often necessary sometimes we need to break down the old in order to to recognize the new or, or even more than the new, that which is timeless. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. So we have to create space, right? So it's like if everything's jammed up with all these things that we don't want or things that we find, you know, 
we don't need that experience anymore, or we don't need to be in the middle of that experience anymore. You know, we have to make room for something else to, you know, to come in. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, we're just jamming everything together. And if we are an infinite space that can be, you know, that just has endless uh, amount of hard drive space to put all this information in, um, you know, then we have to have a, you know, something that can pick out what experience we're, we're looking for at the time. And I just don't know if most people have that amount of computing power, so to speak, on board, you know, so it's like, it's a little bit easier to identify those things in chunks and uh, break them down and, and sort mm -hmm. of, you know, uh, achieve them a piece at a time and sure. bring them into play, basically. Yes, yes. So can you give us uh, uh, an example of, of a chunk? Sure, sure. Well, <laughs> I would break it into, you know, three, um, three basic aspects. Uh, one, the first one is reference, you know, so uh, know thyself is probably the older term, right, which is mm -hmm. a, above the, um, the temple of Apollo, you know, mm -hmm. and so uh, it was both a warning and a uh, admonition, you know, to, to know thyself. And what does that mean in a spiritual context? Well, you know, if we don't, if we're going on a journey, we don't, and we don't know where we're starting from, somebody puts a bag over our head and drops us someplace. We don't know even our first step is in the right direction or not. And so we need to know where we are right now. You know, one of my teachers would say, we need to be brutally honest with ourselves <laughs> about the aspects of our life. And um, this is one of the better ways I've found to do that, which is, you know, just sit, quiet place, give yourself five minutes and just observe your thoughts, observe the thoughts that come and go. You can let them go just like many teachings say, you know, they come up, they present themselves and you let them go. And the next one comes in and let it go. And, you know, most traditions that I've seen, the idea is that by doing that, it slowly diminishes the flow of thoughts into your conscious mind. Mm -hmm. And so for us, when we do that, because we're giving it a very short period of time to do it, um, we notice certain patterns when we come out, you know, we write those patterns down. You know, if, if we see like, oh, gee, I'm always, uh, you know, thinking about, I can't go a couple seconds without thinking about my checkbook, or I can't go as few seconds without this argument that I had with someone or whatever it is, or my health condition or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so um, it shows us a pattern of where our mind, you know, spends most of its time during the day. Mm -hmm. It's constantly coming back to those things. And so the next step along that path would be, you know, dissipation or how do we clear that space a bit, you know? And so, uh, there's a process that we use generally. There are a number of sub processes below that, but basically called a burning meditation, which is, uh, you know, a number of traditions have this. In fact, every tradition that I've studied has it, and I've not studied many that have it as well. And this particular model comes from the Tibetan uh, Bon tradition. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it's basically how to burn off stress and mental fatigue. And so, but once you identify what that specific stressor or mental fatigue is, which is what comes up, you know, in your observation of mind, and then you identify it or symbolize it with certain colors and certain patterns. And, you know, through the same process, you burn that off. And so um, stress that's acquired through the mind or mental process is most readily taken out by the same process. And so, um, and this has a profound effect on most people and it's a good starting place for that. Mm -hmm. And then of course we have a space right after that, if we've done it well, or in any way that we think we've done some, and so we create a space. And so what are you going to fill that space with? And so the third step would be, um, you know, filling it with something that you desire, something that you want, you know, process more energy, you know, um, or uh, even a blank slate, you know, to be able to, uh, you know, sort of 
tie your energy together without these other bindings being on there. So in a different configuration. So I find that those three processes are, you know, really important. I mean, there's much more than that, but most of them can be put under one of those three headings. Um, and there are many, many, many techniques. And so, you know, I always remember um, <laughs> one of my teachers saying, you know, I'm going to give you this technique, do it. But if, you know, if it doesn't work for you, don't worry. You know, it was always a big thing. Don't worry, you know, because there are millions of techniques and we'll find one that works for you. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> it was, I think he had a good beat on, you know, Western mentality at that time, you know, right. Just, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. I want it yeah. now. I want it now. I want it now. And also I mean, now, the, yeah. <laughs> and, and also just the idea that, you know, we, we put a lot on ourselves to do it correctly, you know, to get the result that we want. And, oh, absolutely. and, and you know, and they were very, um, it, it was another one of those uh, techniques, I guess, or part of their tradition that they wouldn't give you a lot of, um, they wouldn't tell you their experiences for the most part until after you had had your own. Right, because they right. didn't want you chasing their experience. No, yeah. Which can be really frustrating for people. You know, they don't think they get it right because it wasn't identical to the person that taught them. And it's like, no, nothing could be further from the truth. You know, <laughs> this is this is not that, right? It's uh, oh yeah. yeah it it know, has it, to be authentic for you, otherwise it's of course, you know, it's again, just we mimicking. Have our, we have our life experiences, right? Where again, we're all fingerprints. So, you know, our um our ability or our mind's ability, our subconscious ability to, you know, culminate all of those experiences and then push them into, you know, something that you're um, manipulating with your mind, you know, practice of some sort to come up with some other experience. That's a big deal, mm -hmm. you know, and very private, very, very personal for each person, you know? So, yeah. So I've always followed that as well. You know, that it's, I mean, I'll give hints about the signposts along the way, but not the actual experience itself, you know, what that's supposed to entail sure. for them. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And again, if it's a, if it's an experience, it's limited in time anyway, it's just a, right. It's just a piece. It's not the whole thing. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. So that's, that's pretty much the process. I mean, without going into all the, all the techniques, but um, I'd like to go over one anyway. Oh, to, please, so please people, go. You know, no, I, I love that. What, what, I always ask um, everyone I interview if they have something they'd like to share from their tool chest. If they have a tool chest, many many of them don't. <laughs> they're they're uh, they're more direct path at, or um, no path teachers as opposed to. Um, the, the the gradual path but yeah, yeah. what do you so, got um i would say this one links pretty closely to the greatest secret sure you know, as far as experiencing awareness it's just more of a step-by-step -step process sure and so um traditionally they would uh start with uh, a completely dark room and uh, with one single candle lit you're sitting in front of that candle um, and then, uh, either with the candle still burning, relaxing the body and, uh, you know, a little bit more advanced technique would be to put the candle out completely. So you're sitting in a completely dark room mm -hmm. and, uh, in a comfortable seated position. And then you just state out loud, I have a body, but I am not this body. And there's a pause and a gap and space. And then the next thing is, I have thoughts, but I'm not my thoughts. And a pause and a space. And I have emotions, but I am not my emotions. Pause and space. I have a mind but I'm not my mind, pause, space. And then singly, I am.
with a bit longer pause. See how long you can stay in that place. And then finally, I am I. And again, sit for a minute in that space. And that's it. It's a very simple practice. And one of the things to look for is, I always find it interesting uh, when you get to the place where I am with nothing at the end. There's a bit of discomfort that comes up for a lot of people at that point. You know, it's like waiting for the next right. identifier. <laughs> yeah, we're habituated to adding right. something to the end of that, that right. statement, yes. And it's a true, you know, it's like a true indicator, you know, where am I along this, along this path, so to speak? And, you know, how comfortable can I be in that nothingness, you know, and everythingness at the same time, right? Yes. So, and then when I come back with the IMI, things seem to like a, like a chord in the symphony that then resolves, you know? Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. so you feel this sense of, oh, okay, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's much better. So, you know, that's, that's one simple practice that people can do to sort of bring themselves closer to that spot, at least within the greatest secret that, you know, am I aware, right. you know, this is just like a peeling off of those layers one by one, sort of resting in them, seeing where the friction is or, or not. Or not. Right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, it sounds like fun. it sounds like fun. It's something you could probably do though without the dark room, without the candle, couldn't you? Oh, sure. Couldn't you just simply oh, sure. eyes open or eyes closed, just focus on those statements and then and, and, and just see where it leads you. You can. It's the idea. I think is more akin to almost um, as close to some type of uh, sensory deprivation tank, if we want to use right, the right, term, right, 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 where it's like you're removing anything that could draw you in to something, right? right. A space, sure. of a light, candle. It's amazing how many people, you know, um, even lifelong meditators that have a difficulty meditating in a dark room. I mean, a completely dark room, you know, with no light coming in and no sense of where they are, or what's going on. Because, you know, when we meditate with a source of light or, or anything like that, you know, a lot of people, they'll close their eyes and, you know, but if something disturbing comes up, you open your eyes, it's a natural response, right? And so, um, but when you do that in a completely dark room, you're still left where you are, right? There's really nothing there to give you a sensory array of, you know, what you experienced is not so, right? And so um, it sort of drives the drives the practice a little deeper. Sure, sure, yeah. I, I, I can see that. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. But it's interesting the response that people have as well, right? And it should be interesting to each of us, our own personal response. Yes. Yeah, it's, uh, it tells us a lot about ourselves. And again, that's part of that first stage of know thyself, right? Which yes. is a constant, it's a constant movement in that direction. It's a practice that we never give up you know, because we're constantly changing, right? All of our experiences, our life experiences, they change us in every moment. Uh, you know, we sit down to meditate and we know that we'll be changed before we right. get up. Sure. <laughs> so does you, does any of your practices of, uh, focus on that which never changes? Which is awareness? Well, it's it, you could call it awareness, or you could call it empty fullness, or you could call it um, beingness. Like, are we talking about the one infinite intelligence? That... Yeah, you could call it that too. Yeah, um, we usually use the one. It's just an again an old simple term, uh -huh. but uh, thinking that. All of us are aspects of that one. All of the, uh, you know, we're the, you know, I usually tell students who are the, the POV of the one, you know, it's like, you know, we come down here to, uh, so that the one can experience itself, right? As if we look at the old stories and 
um, some of the old traditions. So in that respect, yeah, we do. We do, uh, they call it open focus meditation, which you may be familiar with as well. Mm -hmm. So it's like, again, and the counterpoint of being able to focus completely on a single thing, whatever that is, sound, or sight, whatever it is. And, and then what is the space around that thing? You know, how is it, you know, impacted by that? How does it resonate out into that? And all of the things, the point of um, culmination of this energy, this thing, whatever it is that we're focusing on, is just an outcropping of that energetic substrate, if we will, frequency, mm -hmm. vibration, however, whatever term is most comfortable for people. When we look at it that way, it tends to bring a little more sense to all of this, I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just because it doesn't deny either the thing or the space. It just gives them two sides of the same coin, basically, you know, if this, if, all of this that we're experiencing is an outcropping of the one thing, then it's, then it makes more sense that we're just having an experience. Right. Right. And we can make of it what we want. We can suffer in it. We can go beyond it. We can make it into something else. Yes. And, and that's it. That's very free flowing. That substrate is, you know, there's nothing that it isn't. There's nothing right. that it can't <laughs> penetrate. There's, we're all part of that, right? So yes. uh, it makes it a little easier, especially I think in distressing times to really bring that to focus, right? It doesn't keep us from feeling, you know, uh, greatness or suffering or anything else. It's truly an experience um, that this specific aspect is having and relaying that instantaneously to the one, right? Mm -hmm. So that it can experience itself through me. I always, you know, I've always said to students, uh, I have one fear that I constantly try to move beyond and my whole life or practice life has been around that, which is, you know, you pass on, and you end up in a room, this is my image, you end up in a room on a couch and there's the one sitting there and he's just looking at you and saying, I gave you the keys to the kingdom and you sat on the couch. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, I am not going to let that happen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, again, I'm engaged hundred percent. Yeah. In my experience, Brian, you're, you're very much how all of us are programmed. We're all programmed to think we we're, we have to do and accomplish and become more. And, uh, and that's, that is just kind of a universal programming when it comes mm. to the person. Yeah. Where does the programming come from? Well, it comes from that empty fullness. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and it returns there too. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And it actually doesn't exactly. leave. <laughs> right. So all we can do is modify the program, right? Right. And, uh, you know, and utilize that to the best of our ability. I think it's, I think it's that creative nature in us that drives us forward. Once we have that understanding, or at least that idea, mm -hmm. then it's like, how can I engage this in the best possible way? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, and all of us are a little bit different from that. Right? No, it's totally. Like, you know, so it's uh, for me and at least the, the people that have, you know, gotten something out of, you know, what I teach is that, you know, they're doers, you know, and they embrace the doing and, and they get a lot out of it and, uh, and it enriches their life. And, mm -hmm. and with every experience, it gives them more of the experience of, of the one. And so, and I think it's just my steps are more incremental instead of just jumping right into that. Sure, you know? sure. And I don't know. It's kind of I've I've always tried to make the case that you know engaging in a personal spirituality is no different than engaging in anything else that we've done in our lives. When we oh, try absolutely. to set it, when we set it up with two different models, it becomes something hard to you know encapsulate and. 
it. It's like, we don't have to, no, you know, no, we're, we don't. We're, we're readily geared for this. You know, <laughs> it's like, you just have to have the, you know, the, you know, the desire to engage it and, yes. and really bring it to life. So uh, for me, that's, that's been an overwhelming drive since I can remember even as a kid. So mm. it's uh, that's uh, you know, a big deal. And for me again, learning it as I've learned everything else, one step at a time, just makes good sense to me. That's great. No, that's perfect. Yeah. So um, do you have uh, anything else you wanted to weave people with, either a thought or a, a, a process? Sure. Or something you'd want to challenge them to do over the next period of time? Yeah, I would say um, as far as a challenge goes, I would take seven days, take a week. And so we, you know, not that I want to go and dump a bucket of ice water over my head for, you know, that type of challenge, but this is one that's a little bit more internal um, where you'll see benefits very, very quickly. Um, so the, at least the traditional way to start, this would be start on the actual day of your birth. So if you were born on a Monday, meaning the day of the week, not, not your actual birthday, right? So uh -huh. day of the week, they consider the day of your birth. So that's sort of the start of your week. And so you'd start there and then end the day previous. So, um, and when you do that, uh, it sort of takes your personal natural cycle, you know, and sort of engages you um, in an energetic flow that's natural for you. So it kind of gives you a little bit of a boost when we um, uh, put into the mix this timing, it actually has a little bit of a push to it. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so when I first start with this, I go um, and I think some people will probably have already done this practice. It, it's the centering prayer, I think, in Christian tradition, mm -hmm. um, where they use the word Christ. In our case, we use the word awareness. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but you could do it with almost anything, right? And so the idea is, uh, you know, the centering prayer or the centering process is, um, again, quiet, still your mind as much as possible, relax your body so that your energy is moving more efficiently and more fluidly, and then stay, uh, in this case, awareness above me, awareness below me, awareness in front of me, awareness behind me, awareness to my left, awareness to my right, awareness within me. And that's it. It's a simple practice. If you do it when you first get up in the morning, whether it's in bed or out of bed, if you do it sometime around the middle of the day, and then sometime in the evening before you go back to bed, uh, three times a day for seven days and see what kind of impact that has on your life through the course of your normal routines in the day. Mm, that's beautiful. Yeah, it's very nice. And, you know, people much like um, with Rhonda's uh, practice of, you know, am I aware? Yes. It's simple, it's easy, and it has a profound effect on just about everything um, that you do throughout the day. So, um, and you should notice a, a difference in some great. way, shape or form, you know, which is really great. Some people feel it right away and others, it may take a few days. And, uh, but consistency is the key, right? Because we're still uploading our mind with what we, with what we want. And most people want to have a deeper connection with that presence with the one. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, if we're always moving in that direction, um, it's a, you know, can be a long journey, but at the same time, every step brings you some new discovery. And I think that that's, that's the essence of it. We, uh, for me, it's, it's loving this life and engaging in it fully and, and, uh, and finding the one through those experiences.
I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Brian Osborne. You can learn more about Brian at 2bsilent.com. That's the number two and the letter B, silent.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe so you have immediate access to future episodes. Please give us a five-star rating and share it with the people you care about. If you'd like to learn more about my work, my mentor Lester Levinson's work, and the Sedona Method, please visit www.sedona.com. As you explore our site, you learn the key to lasting happiness, success, peace, and emotional well-being. We have books, courses, events, and plenty of free material to explore. Again, go to Sedona.com. That's S-E-D-O-N-A.com. Thank you for being here, and we'll catch you in the next episode of Letting Go and the Greatest Secret.